Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Give us an, about one more minute. We're going to wait until the attendee list starts trickling to a halt, and we will get started. All right, hey everybody, welcome to another episode of When Things Go Wrong. Really excited to have Mark and Mike here as our guest panelists. Um, I'm David Valencourt, CEO and founder of the GNP Collective. Before I hand it over to Bethany, I'm just gonna go through a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, this episode, just like all episodes, uh, this being our 18th episode, which I'm just so appreciative for all the guests that we've had thus far. In a row, all of our episodes, including this one, will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. So if you missed one, if uh, you're not able to catch the whole one today or want to share it with somebody, please just send them to our website or our YouTube channel. Um, we've got some great questions during the registration, but if something comes up during the episode that kind of inspires you and you want to put Mark or Mike on the hot seat, that's what they're here for. We are here for you guys. So go ahead and throw a question in. You can even ask it anonymously if you don't want your name to be outed. Um, and we will do our best to prioritize and answer them. If we don't get through them all, which has been fairly common for us to not get through, um, we will follow up as part of our um, linking it on the website and getting an answer, a written answer for you guys. So um, with that, we've got one hour sharp. We're down to 57 minutes. Let me hand it over to Bethany to take us away. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm happy to be your moderator again of When Things Go Wrong, where we discuss various challenges and issues within the cannabis industry with the aim of offering valuable insight, tips, and solutions. I'm the Director of Content Strategy and Market Growth at the GMP Collective, and I'm excited to continue working with all these brilliant and passionate experts in the cannabis and hemp industry. So uh, you all know David Valancourt, CEO of the GMP Collective and co-founder of S3 Collective and vice chair of ASTM International Committee D37 on Cannabis. Let me introduce our guest, Mike Lamudo of Dow Mastery and also a MCBA board chair. Mike is co-founder of Dow Mastery and, as I mentioned, is board chair of the Minority Cannabis Business Association and organizes their equity workshop tour. He brings the experience of having transitioned over the course of two decades from the legacy space into the regulated cannabis industry. In 2019, Mike joined the DEI committee at NCIA, quickly taking a leadership position and eventually signing on with the organization in an official capacity to build out its comprehensive DEI program. Mike is recognized by his peers as a tireless advocate for the new industry's potential as a game changer regarding inclusivity and diversity. And also welcoming Mark Ross of Needle Consultants, LLC. Mark is the former head of impact and ESG at Vicente Cedarberg, a leading cannabis law firm. And he was the director of community outreach for Harvest Health and Recreation. Prior to that, he was the founder and former executive director of Rock the Earth, other experience includes serving as in-house environmental attorney and as a litigator at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Since 2016, Mark has been consulting companies, most notably in the cannabis space, on matters surrounding corporate social responsibility and environmental, social, and governance principles, which we will be diving into today. So, as I mentioned, we're talking about ESG and DEI practices and why they're important for the future of the cannabis industry. It's important to note that there is currently an ASTM Cannabis Subcommittee 
D37.93 on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that group of individuals have the goal of developing related standards for the cannabis and hemp industries. David, as someone who's been involved in ASTM for a long time, uh, would you like to mention anything about this part of ASTM? Yeah, so thanks, Bethany. You know, there's, um, as the vice chair of ASTM's committee D37, D37 has been around since 2017, so that's definitely a long time. Uh, <laughs> I would say we're going up on seven years now. Um, and as you mentioned, there is a subcommittee on DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, I think that, you know, two things I want to share about that. One is the significance of in the breadth of what ASTM's committee on cannabis covers. So for folks that may be familiar with ASTM from more of an engineering background, there's a lot of very technical standards, um, you know, test methods, performance standards, but there's also practices, guides, and most importantly, terminology, because words matter, right? When we're talking about diversity, what in the heck does that mean? Mike might have a different interpretation of how to define diversity than Mark, and there could be regional and international differences. So right now there's actually, it has not gone to ballot yet, but I'm looking at it because I've been part of this task group led by um, an incredible individual named Martha Bizek, and uh, we have Cheryl Marie Powell, who is the chair of that subcommittee. And there's actually a very long definition, a uh, thorough definition for both diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so if you're not a member and that's something you feel very passionate about that you want to maybe, you know, opine on to make sure that we have this true definition, um, please become a member because it will be going to ballot in the next few weeks to give your, um, you know, candid, constructive feedback. Um, so really excited to see that come forward. We have briefed uh, the Cannabis Regulators Association on this a couple of months ago and already gotten some of their feedback. So this is something that really is a uh, powerful global standard once it gets together. So um, yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Bethany. Great. Um, Mike, did you want to add anything about the ASTM DEI committee? Um, well, I mean, always want to shout out Cheryl Murray Powell because um, she's just amazing, amazing, a major champion for equitable, you know, equitable uh, industry um, everywhere, uh, really, and not just in, in the U.S., but she also does a lot of work internationally, too. And, um, you know, I've gotten to learn a lot about what ASTM has done through her and as well as through David. Um, the specific thing you mentioned, the, I think the, the legacy definition, um, I really love the legacy definition, to be quite frank. I think that um, you know, being able to have that as a standardized thing and also the fact that it, it to me, really spoke to me as far as, um, you know, like it, it took a lot of great things into consideration. And when I learned about the process it took to get that definition in place, that it wasn't just like one person came up with it and just kind of was like, all right, let's do this. But it was actually a very collaborative effort. Um, I thought, OK, this this makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, obviously there's never going to be one size fits all for anything ever. But at the same time, if we can start standardizing in a way that you know, allows for legacy folks in this industry that, you know, like myself, that come from the space before it was technically defined and regulated and all this kind of stuff. I think it gives us more opportunity to be able to be in the industry uh, and to really carve, start carving out our space. So uh, I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Cool. <clears throat> well, moving right along, uh, Mike, what motivated you to specialize in diversity, equity and inclusion within the cannabis and hemp industry? Yeah, um, you know, great question, because uh, I, I really never saw myself being in any kind of DEI space or role, so to speak. Um, growing up out in San Francisco, to be quite frank, uh, you know, I kind of was turned off by a lot of what I thought was very performative. I learned that we're performative over the last few years, very performative measures uh, for diversity while watching the city become, you know, everybody I knew getting forced out of the city, uh, getting evicted, um, you know, all these programs kind of putting people into tiny boxes, so to speak. Um, you know, and so it kind of it turned me off in a lot of ways. But when I saw the similar types of efforts happening in cannabis, I thought two things. One was we have the opportunity here to actually make a difference in this industry because we're building it in so many ways from the ground up. And I found a lot of people doing this kind of work now in this space that feel very similar, that were burnt out on doing this work in other arenas, um, but feel that cannabis does offer the ability to, to really make the impact there. And then when you combine that with the fact that this is also an industry that in so many ways, I think, is tied to diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, more than a lot of other industries, so to speak, because of their roots in the war on drugs. Uh, I think it really makes it that much more important 
to also stand up DEI in this space. So it was those two things combined. One, the ability to do it, I think was really important to me. And then two, kind of the calling of the importance of it uh, if we're gonna build this industry the right way. Because when we saw it be starting to be formed about what, 10 years ago when the first regulated market started coming online, it didn't really look like uh, you know very diverse to be quite frank. So anyway, that's in a nutshell what, um, what I would say. Well said, thank you for that. And Mark, uh, what led you to specialize in ESG, which we'll learn more about, and its application in the cannabis and hemp industry? Yeah, th thanks, Bethany. Thanks for having me, uh, both you and David. Uh, this is a great conversation. I'm so excited to get to work with Mike on this. Uh, you know, I have been an environmental attorney for 30 years. I started my career uh, in the public sector, environmental prosecutor, moved to the private sector, large law firm, big company. Uh, and then I created a national environmental advocacy nonprofit in the music industry. So I had this deep environmental litigation um, and sustainability experience from a variety of perspectives. And when I was looking for my next opportunity in 2016, a couple key people in government and industry said, you should look at the cannabis industry here in Colorado, which is where I'm located. Um, their opinion being outside the industry and looking in when it came to corporate social responsibility and ESG, companies really weren't doing it in a very strategic ROI driven authentic way. Um, you were finding these shotgun marriages between community groups that would take money and licensees that wanted to put it in a license application. And that was, you know, pretty much the extent of what they saw as corporate responsibility in the cannabis industry. And, and I want to draw a line here between corporate responsibility and ES and G uh, because it gets conflated. And if you want to put up slide two, um, I'll get to ESG in a second. Corporate social responsibility is basically an extension of what we've been seeing for the last 50 years in corporate America, corporate citizenship. It's, uh, it are pro these are programs around environmental sustainability. These are programs around people and um, uh, around community. These are programs around um, uh, health and safety inside a company. These are programs around philanthropy, uh, but they're programs. And um, what ESG is, is more analytical than programmatic. So what it does is it, ESG takes those programs that a company may have in those three areas, and they start to measure the outputs and outcomes of those programs for reporting to third-party stakeholders. In particular, uh, investors, those that may be looking to make an investment, government regulators, and of course, employees and communities. So when you think about ESG, um, and, and the benefits are the same, we'll get to the benefits later in this webinar of having a a very strategic, integrated, and authentic CSR program. The same applies in the ESG program. So in general, E, the environmental one, or your water, your waste, your packaging, your uh, carbon footprint, um, it's a whole variety of uh, pesticide usage. Your S or your social. So this is where you put your DEI program, um, how you treat your employees, their benefits, their pay, um, uh, the um, the way you treat your community, how you engage your community, volunteerism, um, uh, diversity within management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then governance are your formal policies that support um, a variety of, of strategic uh, initiatives and your ESG. So when I think of governance policies, I think of anti-slavery policies, anti-child uh, labor policies. I think of pay disparity and uh, equality policies. I think of independent board members and board makeup policies, uh, how you do your accounting, how you do your lobbying, what will you do, what won't you do, your risk management policies, your supply chain um, policies, uh, your supplier policies. And so that's generally what es &G is. Um, and, you know, my interest in this is I was looking for a place where I could apply my some knowledge to a new industry and really bring it along. And when I looked at cannabis in 2016, these two these two gentlemen from outside of cannabis were not incorrect in that there was an opportunity here. And so I started to write about it and started to get out to speak about it and worked with NCIA on an employee engagement white white paper. Thanks, Bethany. And um, and next thing I know, I got hired by Harvest Health and Recreation to build their corporate responsibility program. And that's how I got 
to, and that was in 2019. So that's how my career pivoted into this space. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely remember um, in my previous role when you uh, when we worked together on getting that out. That was that was a very cool project. Um, so here we are now. Um, how do each of these DEI and ESG considerations in the cannabis industry and sector, how are they different from every other industry? Uh, and what are the specific challenges uh, for our cannabis and hemp industry? Mike, do you want to start? Yeah, so we only have about 44 minutes left, right? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that, right, just like everything else in this industry, I think so many things are complex, right? Um, and I think when we're talking about DEI in the first place, we're already talking about a pretty complex, uh, you know, system or situation or program in the first place, right? Uh, even for regular corporate, regular corporations. Um, so when we're talking about cannabis, trying to roll that into the framework becomes really challenging. Uh, and when you combine that with the fact that there's a lot of virtue signaling in cannabis, right? Because we have an industry that is kind of has a lot of roots in activism and advocacy. Uh, and so there's a lot of companies that have come into the space, um, some with that, that were in the space originally, some that weren't, a lot that weren't, honestly, um, that come in with, you know, using a lot of the catchphrases associated with DEI, uh, seemingly implementing those kinds of things on the surface, but not really doing the real work underneath, right? Um, because they know that that's going to capture them the market share. It's going to capture them, you know, employees that are a little bit more, you know, interested. So they use that kind of catchphrase on the top. The challenge I find is, you know, finding the companies that are willing to actually do the real work underneath it all um, without the virtue signal rewards. Because if you're already getting the rewards from the virtue signaling and people already think that you're doing the work on the outside, getting you to actually change the inside is really, really challenging. Um, and I think to me, that would be one of the biggest challenges faced. Uh, and then, you know, there's, of course, when it comes down to all the social equity licensing type of structures, um, and that creates a whole nother set of problems because the way that it's been set up has, quite frankly, not been too equitable uh, in the way that things have rolled out, right? So, you know, when we when we combine the, the regulatory framework and then we take the, the the fact of like getting just the human nature of, hey, if I'm already getting a little bit of play for, you know, seeming like I care about this kind of stuff, why would I do anything further? You combine those two th types of things and you create an environment that I think is very challenging to really get people to adopt it, um, you know, and, and in a way that is going to really make impact. That's that's what I would say is where the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges, at least. <laughs> yep. Makes sense. Uh, Mark, can you uh, speak to the ESG framework being applied to the cannabis sector? Sure. I mean, the ESG framework applies to any sector. It applies to tech sector. It applies to manufacturing. It applies across the world. Uh, cannabis is no different. Cannabis is agriculture. Cannabis is manufacturing. Cannabis is retail. Cannabis is tech. Cannabis is transportation. Cannabis is all the different things that all these other industries have that are already reporting ESG. Um, the question is, where do you prioritize it in cannabis? Um, often I see cannabis companies jump into this without having a, a really solid um, integrated foundation of a mission, vision, and values that have been established, a screen through which all decisions can be made. So if sustainability is one of your, say, values, that you're screening all decisions through sustainability. If diversity is one of your values, that you're screening all your decisions through diversity. So I think where you start is, one, you need to have that solid foundation, that mission, vision, and values. And sometimes you need someone to come in and help you pull that out of you uh, because you've got lots of different ideas. Number two, once you get there, if you're looking at E, S, and G, because of – normally I would say E because there's it's very metric-focused and we're way behind on the environmental. But the cannabis industry is special, real special, because of what Mike alluded to, the history of criminalization, the impact – of the war on drugs, on communities of color, um, uh, the prison industrial complex. There are a lot of social mm -hmm. reasons why we need to start with ES and why most companies in cannabis, uh, if they are going to have an ESG or CSR program, it gravitates towards the people, gravitates towards community, it gravitates towards social equity, social impact, repair of communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs. It's around education, it's around accelerators, it's around social equity licenses. So in terms of prioritization, you got to start, I think, with the S, just given the nature of the industry. That's helpful. Thanks. Um, let's cover briefly some examples of how companies have successfully integrated 
both DEI and ESG practices and lessons that others can learn from those experiences. Mark, can you jump in? Sure. You know, there aren't, let, let's be honest here, in terms of companies in cannabis that and hemp uh, that are putting out ESG reports, uh, true ESG reports, they're few and far between. That said, there are companies that are engaging in environmental social governance and corporate social responsibility, some of it performative, like Mike has mentioned, but some of it really uh, integrated into their, their business model. Um, you know, I used to say that um, the gold standard for companies really measuring and reporting and setting goals, which is the third part of ESG, setting goals uh, and continuous improvement, was canopy growth. Uh, they put out an ESG report, I think it was uh, 2020, um, and it was really not like anything that this industry had ever seen. Uh, you would expect a report like that out of a company, say, um, Miller Coors or, or Unilever or a, a company like that, where it really went deep on a whole bunch of ESG issues. It integrated it with their financial performance. It, uh, it identified gaps in where they needed information. They were very transparent about where they were going to go. Unfortunately, uh, as we all know, uh, change is the one constant in this industry. Uh, and folks that put that report together are no longer at Canopy. Um, there are some other companies that have done some smart ESG work. Rubicon Organics, also out of Canada on a smaller scale, has really separated themselves uh, as a craft grower um, by putting out uh, uh, what I would consider to be a, a fairly robust ESG report for an operation of their size. Um, and, and then Cureleaf, interestingly enough, put out an impact report a few years ago, maybe it was two years ago, uh, a year and a half, two years ago, which was very specific and not being called an ESG report because they recognized they didn't have the data around environmental, but they had a lot of data around their social impact, very similar to Cresco's seed report. Um, those have been some good examples. And lastly, I just want to hit on uh, the two gummy companies that a lot of people think of, WANA and uh, Wild, doing things very differently in the space. WANA is not putting out a report, but WANA did make moves several years ago to reduce their packaging intentionally as sustainability was an in, was one of their values. But in the wake of the George Floyd killing, they also set up an entirely different web portal, separate from theirs, to deal with um, racism, anti-racism training, diversity, equity, and inclusion resources, really separate from the company, but part of the company's ethos and part of their values. And so I thought that was an interesting move. Um, and then Wild's been, they put out a sustainability report. I think they just put out their second or third one. They've really been trying to lead the conversation around sustainability in manufacturing, uh, in, in consumables and edibles. Uh, and so they've been doing some interesting things around it. But again, nobody's really put out the gold standard report like I saw that would be rec internationally recognized in the ESG community as being robust um, as Canopy Growth did. Very interesting. Great. Uh, Mike, would you like to speak to DEI examples uh, in companies? Yeah. In our industry? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I mean, I, and, I, and, you know, as Mark pointed out, you know, I did mention earlier the performative nature of a lot of what we see, but what we, a lot of what we see is also now starting to shift and change, I would say, uh, in the fact that we do have a lot of companies now that it may, maybe took these companies a little longer to get that traction, a little longer to get, you know, further to where they are now. But they, these companies have really built into their ethos, like really built into the foundation, uh, the, the DEI side of things, right, being more responsible. Um, and so, you know, th there's a lot of different examples I can think of. The, the one that comes to mind right now, because right now I'm planning, a, we're about to launch the Equity Workshop Tour. Um, and one of the venues that we're going to be doing this at in Portland is uh, Nimble Distro. Um, and so Nimble Distro, um, I learned about this myself just uh, last week. Uh, they they have a program. They work with a new project, uh, Jeanette Ward, um, one of the founding members, I believe, of the MCBA board. Um, you know, she she um she has a project called New Project, and they work directly with you know local entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of color, um, to really provide support. And they get, I, I want to say, the number that was given me was ninety three thousand dollars came directly from Nimble Distro as part of their um like their, their you know their give back type of program, right? Where uh, basically uh, for every and I can't remember the, the details. Forgive me here. But um, I think it's for every joint that they sell underneath a certain brand, there's a specific amount of money that, that goes to new project. And they have a couple of different initiatives like this. And one of the things that stood out to me was that 
um, one, it's a financial thing, right? And too often people like to just kind of, you know, say a couple things, do a couple marketing things, so on, so on and so forth. But then the folks doing the work, like the new projects of the world, are still sitting there trying to scrape and scrap, putting the money together. To have a program that is saying, hey, we're going to directly make sure that a specific amount of money and not just like a portion of proceeds, but a tied dollar amount to each joint sold, to each product sold, is it's built into the cost of goods. And it's going to go directly to a project like New Project that's going to then help specifically entrepreneurs that are looking to develop themselves in the industry. I think that to me is a perfect example. And it's something that honestly, um, you know, doesn't really take that much it's just about prioritization and putting you know, whether it's a few cents or whatever it may be into your cost of goods, right? Just like any other of your cost of goods. If you say you care about breaking greater DEI in the industry, then, you know, put your money where your mouth is. So that's one example, Nimble Distro right there. Um, you know, I also would say, you know, uh, that I, I work with a lot of different uh, companies, for example, like Canada Coverage, right? Um, that, uh, you know, is an insurance company that basically sponsors some of our events, right? Um, and what it's not just that they sponsor events, right? It's also that they show up. Right. They they show up on the planning calls. They put in their input. Um, they want to make sure that they're connected to the community. Right now, this is a very diverse uh, group themselves. Right. It's, it's minority owned, women owned, you know, uh, and, and everything in themselves. But it's not, you know, not enough to just be like, OK, hey, hey, we're minority owned. It's let's make sure we're connected to the community. Let's make sure we're hearing what the community is saying. Let's make sure we're showing up the events, helping provide space for the events to happen, things of that nature. Right. All these little things add up, so to speak. Right. And I believe that over time, what we're going to see is companies that are doing this kind of stuff um, are going to have, and, and this is what Nimble was saying to me directly, they've had, as a result, greater partnerships developed, greater, you know, uh, a team. Uh, they don't have as high of a turnover, things of that nature. Because at the end of the day, uh, especially in this newer generation that's coming up, they really care about having, being tied to a company that has a mission. And it's not just that these are employees, right, of companies that are coming up. Now you're seeing, it's crazy to me whenever I look around, I see like these business owners that are entrepreneurs that are like 28 years old. And I'm like, wow, but of course, these are full grown adults, right? Well, I was trying, hopefully to do that when I was that age too. And now, but these are now a new generation that really care about missions. And so if you need partners in your business, you need vendors and sponsors and, you know, brand ambassadors and team members, you need to start thinking about how to do that. So these companies that we see out there, um, we are really careful about who we partner with on the tour because um, we want to make sure that we're working with people that take it another step and don't just simply throw a little bit of cash our way, but actually are committed to the cause and understand what we're really trying to build here. To me, that's where DEI the, at this point in the industry tends to really be strong is people putting their money where their mouth is and their time uh, where their mouth is as well. So uh, that, that's what I would say. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Um, David, would you like to add anything? Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm enjoying this conversation so much learning here. And, you know, I think, you know, talk is cheap, right? It's really easy to put flashy words down and say, here's our mission. Here's what we're going to do. We're different. We're better. But but how do you prove that? Right. And if you can't, if you're not measuring it. You can't manage it. It's just, you know, Mike's word versus Mark's word versus mine. And that that never wins at the end of the day. And so, you know, it's been really inspiring even thinking about hearing about whether it's Wana or Wild and what Cureleaf has done in the past, large companies, but just small companies, you know, where you mentioned the distro uh, out of Oregon, Mike. And I think that really goes to show and, you know, can of coverage, like, what are you doing to actually support this mission? And it's an amazing opportunity, whether it's employee, you know, you know turnover and looking at those types of metrics that when somebody shows up to work and hears all these great things and reads this, you know, sexy tagline, the mission, and then actually sees it in real life. And then at monthly report, uh, you know, monthly or quarterly employee meetings, you actually have a mentor to say, look what we did. We gave back so many dollars, you know, quantifiable things that makes people feel good. And that extends to the consumer. So these are, these are things. And I really like, you know, Mark, as you mentioned, you know, relative to their size, you know, if you're a small company and you're like, look, I'm not Coca-Cola, I'm not you know, Fortune 500. Well, you got to start somewhere and there's little ways. It doesn't have to be an onerous, overwhelming endeavor that takes up all of your staff and resources. So really, you know, think about how you can make these minor improvements um, to really demonstrate your impact and support supports your business. Great. All right, we're at the halfway point. So let's just keep jamming along here. Um, so we have seen specific states like Massachusetts actually write in equity initiatives into their cannabis laws in an effort to reverse the harmful impacts of the war on drugs. And it's a great start. Uh, 
but how do these ESG practices align with current and the potential future regulations in the cannabis and hemp industry? Mark? Yeah, I'm going to let Mike get more specific about the cannabis industry and what's going on with social equity and what's coming down the pike. But there's a huge regulatory landscape out there right now, an ESG regulatory landscape. I am not going to read everything off the next several slides. Uh, hopefully you can go back and watch the review. I believe these slides will be made available as well after the webinar. Uh, so there's a lot of information on these, but there, there's ESG reporting requirements either coming down the pike or already in uh, effect. So the EU has them, um, the Sustainable Financial Disclosure Registration, SCF, SFDR, um, uh, which really just applies to financial markets. But the two big ones are, the, are TCFD, the Task Force of Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which was a voluntary program, but many countries have started to adopt it. And so your deadlines around that vary depending on where you're operating. Um, but it's re with regard to your climate impacts as well as your impacts on nature. Um, and then next slide. The big one, though, in the EU right now um, is this one, the C the, the CS. R, uh, RD, um, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, this is going to uh, this is going to be phased in initially with large uh, publicly traded companies in the EU, but it also applies to privately held companies in the EU. And most importantly, as you'll see underlined in the third or fourth bullet, it applies to non-EU based companies with subsidiaries in the EU. So if you are a cannabis company and you have operations in the EU and you meet certain thresholds regarding the number of employees, financial turnover, balance sheet, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you are going to have to start to report your, uh, I think it's 17 different areas um, around ESG, and it's not just environmental, although it says sustainability. Uh, there are other requirements as well that you need to report. Specifically for American companies that are operating in the EU, uh, it looks like that has been pushed back to 2028, but we're going to start seeing this take effect in 2026. Uh, next slide. There are also specific country requirements. The big one here affecting the U.S. will be the SEC climate disclosure proposal rule. It is supposed to go final, my source to say, around Earth Day this year. Uh, it's been out in public comment for about a year and a half now. Um, it's regarding the measurement and reporting of a company's uh, impact on the climate and the impact that the climate could have on a company. So let's say you're a manufacturer, you've got VOC emissions, you've got greenhouse gases, that's the impact you're having on the environment. Uh, it's also going to require you evaluating what kind of impact climate could have on you, on your supply chain, flooding your factory, et cetera, et cetera, because this is all in the name of giving investors uh, and other stakeholders the full picture of how you could be exposed and what the risk is regarding climate. There's also going to be an SEC human capital disclosure proposal that's probably going to follow this one later this year. Um, in the UK, you've got energy and carbon reporting requirements. You've got governance codes. Next, next slide. Um, and then you've got in Japan, you've got the stewardship code and corporate governance code. So if you do business in any of these countries, you could be swept up. Uh, France has their own uh, corporate duty of vigilance, uh, and that start, that that kicks in if you have at least 5,000 employees in France. That, you can be subject to any of these. Uh, next slide. And then there are also state requirements. This is California. Some of these are already in effect. Um, for example, the corporate board diversity reporting took effect this uh, a year ago. The volunteer carbon market disclosures, if you're going to claim that you are on the path to zero emissions or that you're reducing emissions, or you're going to be carbon neutral. You need to back it up with evidence. You need to show your measurements. You need to show your science-based targets. You need to show your reduction pathway and schedule, and it needs to be third-party certified. That was effective just a few weeks ago. So um, you need to be aware of, and the next slide, New York also has other requirements as well. One that's already in effect is New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, but then this risk Climate Risk Disclosure Act is, is um, it's not enacted yet, but it's a proposed, uh, proposed piece of legislation. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, is there are lots of regulatory requirements coming down the pike in addition to all of the 
uh, financial advantages that having the ESG plan has that we'll touch on in just a few minutes. Wow, that was a lot. Thank you for for all that. Um, Mike, would you like to add to this? Yeah, can you just reframe the question for me? Um, I was, it was wrapped up in what uh, Mark was presenting. So. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, the example of, you know, Massachusetts actually included this uh, in their laws from the get go, uh, New York attempted to do something similar. Uh, so how DEI practices not only currently, but in the future uh, will align with regulations in our industry. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're starting to see it with some of the social equity measures that are being put in place. We're starting to see it with, as Mark mentioned, you know, not just in the cannabis space, but the reporting that California requires in general, I believe, right? That's not just a, a cannabis specific thing. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to see this across municipalities and state laws. Um, and, you know, to tie this back to what I was saying earlier, like, right, look, I mean, you can ignore and say, okay, we're just going to do the performative stuff, right? And hope that you have enough resources to recover from that over time. But the reality is, is that the direction things are going in, right, is, as we mentioned, to tie back to David, these are, there are metrics. There's tons of metrics that support that more sustainable businesses incorporate these kinds of things into their missions. Well, as a result now, governments are starting to do that, right? So governments are starting to do the same thing. And businesses need to be understanding that this is, you have to respond to that because if you do things too performatively at some point, the government doesn't mess around when it comes in with its regulations and its fines and its fees and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and the scandals that result as, you know, come out of that. Um, if you're in cannabis, um, I would say that, you know, uh, right now, you know, for example, I want to tie back to like the turnover type thing, right? Um, you know, a small business might have trouble with turnover because they have very limited resources. But when you look and see like the pervasive problem we see with turnover with businesses that have a lot more resources that really shouldn't be having those problems, um, a lot of that gets tied to the fact that they don't they don't have a mission that's solid. And, you know, as, as Mark mentioned, their vision, their values, their mission aren't all tied together. And to tie this back to the state, you know, with states, a lot of states come out and they have, OK, this program that's going to help solve, you know, the, the wrongs of the war on drugs and all this kind of stuff. Right. We're going to create DEI programs, put it in the laws. But as we know, things take a long time for laws to really not only be implemented, but if we implemented properly and have all the things get worked out as things move forward. One of the pieces that I want to mention here is the advocacy realm, right? Like organizations like MCBA. Um, what we do is we come in and we step in as that kind of filling the gap between the what's happening at the state level and what's happening with businesses and with the community, right? And the reason I'm saying this is because as time develops, as we start to figure out how reporting works, right? Because right now, you know, some of these states have the social equity provisions, but there's not a budget for reporting. But as the tax base builds and as reporting starts to get funded more, these companies, again, are going to have to figure that out. That's where, you, you know, these companies can work directly with advocate organizations to understand how to better, like, be in that space and support things and support measures in such a way that when we go do that work at, at the state level like, of advocacy, lobbying, all that kind of jazz, that we're still also aligned. I don't know if that makes sense when I'm trying to, the, the picture we're trying to paint here, but basically it's this concept that it's not just individual silos. The government is doing what it's doing. The companies are doing what it's doing. The advocates are doing what we're doing in between kind of, and this whole ecosystem is developing and moving forward. And companies need to start understanding that instead of just putting their head in the sand and thinking that, oh, you're just gonna be fine. Because 10 years from now, I think the business landscape in this country is gonna be very different. And this is going to be a massive part of that. And if you want to be sustainable, you can't just do the performative side of it. So hopefully that hits and makes sense. But um, yeah, that's my uh, that's my soapbox. Yeah, to, to Mike's point, one one more thing: how this is all interrelated. You may think you're too small to do an ESG report and to start to manage this data and to find it. You've got one operation. You're not publicly traded. You're not hardly horribly exposed, or you're a service provider like a law firm or accounting firm. You're going to find that these larger companies. Uh, or even the smaller companies in the EU that have to start to report this data, they're going to send you questionnaires and they're going to ask you for your data. It doesn't matter that you're a law firm. They're going to ask you what your carbon footprint is. They're going to ask you what your supply chain looks like if you're a vape company selling into, say, purely, um, making sure that, you're, that your vapes aren't being manufactured by children or Uyghurs in China. Um, th this is all interrelated, as Mike said. So there's the government pushing, there's the advocacy part pushing, there's the company and the investors pushing, there's the employees pushing. Um, and so that's how it's all tied together. Anyway, thanks for 
the uh, indulgence. Sure thing. All right, we're jamming along here. Uh, let's keep going. Um, whether it's part of the laws and regulations or not, uh, to Mike's point about performative, uh, it's one thing for a company to say they have these practices, but what does it look like when it's successful? How do companies, to David's point, measure the success of a DEI initiative and ESG practices? Um, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it, well, one, it depends on where you're putting your efforts, right? So, uh, you know, what I see a lot of time, people will invest, so to speak, in DEI and say that they expect the result to be over here and they're not really looking at the right place, right? For example, like I said earlier, you know, you if if you have a stronger mission or vision, your there's stats that show that your turnover is going to be less than it would be otherwise, right? But if you're over here saying, okay, well, where why aren't I getting more clients from that initiative? Well, okay, but you're saving money on not having to do the turnover stuff. Why do you expect that to be a salve that fixes everything? Just for example, right? Um, so I think the first thing is to really understand which metrics to tie to that. And sometimes it's not always apparent right away, right? So I think what you have to do is take that step back and look in, uh, across the board and say, okay, we implemented this initiative. Since we in implemented this initiative, what has changed overall? And also what other factors are coming into play too, right? If there's a major downturn in the, in the economy, in the marketplace, well, you, you know, don't blame spending money on DEI for why things are, are going bad at your company now, right? Which I actually heard people say that kind of stuff before, and it's just like shocking. It's like, right, really? Um, so you have to understand and look at your analytics. So to, to Mark's point, measuring, right? So, and regardless of how big or how small you are, you should be measuring everything that you're doing, right? If it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get improved. And so, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, if, if we're looking at, um, you know, at, at, uh, at these kinds of metrics, I would say that, you know, that, that employee turnover thing is huge, right? Massive expense that goes into that. Um, but also, you know, think about how you can accelerate your marketing dollars, right? One of the things that I, I've, I've said for a while now is, you know, I, I get a lot of sponsorships for, for these different types of, uh, you know, DEI initiatives that we do. And I always think it's really interesting because, um, you know, the marketing department at that company, sometimes they're set up and they take care of it the right way, but other times they don't do anything with it. And then, and they expected me to just come in here and we're advocates working on nothing to pennies, right, um, on the dollar. And they expect us to create this amazing campaign that's going to solve all of their problems or something and create some massive ROI. And I'm like, look, we gave you all the tools. We, we showed all the impact. We delivered people here to the events, all this kind of stuff. It's up to you to also then integrate that into your overall strategies, right? Um, too often, you know, again, I'm on a soapbox, but too often DEI initiatives get really siloed off and if it doesn't have a direct ROI, we kind of just forget that there's other ways that it's impacted. And it's also up to you as a company to figure out how to take that and maximize it. So, you know, I know that didn't really answer your question, but I think that's, to me, that's more relevant to, to really how the rubber hits the road and how people need to be thinking about it as they're doing this. And this is where working with consultants, people like, you know, cannabis doing good, um, having people like that to talk with to understand what, you know, how you should be looking at things comes into play. Don't just assume that you understand it and are going to be able to like analyze the data on your own if you, you know, if, if you don't have that experience basically. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. All right. We're jamming along here. Uh, I think we've kind of covered some challenges companies face in incorporating DEI and ESG. Um, actually, let me jump back. Um, I think we have a few slides from Mark to show about ESG practices. Um, so let's cover those real quick and then we'll keep going. From McKinsey Quarterly, this is actually a resource that a friend of mine passed along, uh, thanks to my Harvard law friend, uh, McKinsey Quarterly. Mark, do you wanna chat about this? Yeah, and just picking up on the theme of what Mike said about turnover, there are a whole host of benefits um, for having this kind of strategic and integrated ESG, CSR, DEI program that pulls through the entire company. And it's been proven over and over again. This McKinsey uh, report was from uh, 2019. The one Bethany found with regard to top line growth and cost reductions and regulatory um, risk mitigation and productivity from employees that are happier working there goes up. Um, Asset optimization happens, creativity around innovation happens, sustainability drives efficiencies. Um, so it's not just this report, um, but I'm going to go through a bunch of them. You can go back and find them later. Uh, next page, next slide. 
This one from Deloitte, 2022. Does the company's ESG score have a measurable impact on its market value? And spoiler alert, it, it certainly does. Uh, <laughs> MIT did a report in 2022, the economic impact of ESG ratings. Your ESG rating goes up. Hey, so does, um, so does your profitability. You go down, it actually has a corrosive effect on your profitability and your stock performance. Uh, next slide. Uh, Thomson Reuters, this report came out in January of this year, uh, talking about how intangible assets represent more than 90% of a company's value. Intangible assets are reputation. Uh, they're how your employees feel about you. It's how your brand shows in the marketplace. It's uh, have you mitigated all your risks so that way you don't get caught up in a scandal. Um, you know, those are all intangibles that, that feed right into the bottom line value of your company. Uh, return on assets, return on sales, revenue generation, market valuations, and stock performance, all related to ESG. Next one. Next slide. Uh, this KPMG report from 2023, it talks about improving financial performance, M&A efficiency, access to new capital, customer loyalty, attracting new customers. Uh, the statistics go on and on and on. Next slide. This one's from MSCI from 2019, also how it affects equity valuations, risks, and performance, ESG. The bottom line is companies that measure what matters, measure what's material to both the company's operations as well as to its variety of stakeholders inside and outside the company, those companies are better run companies. They're better primed for investment. Institutional investors will look for those, those qualities, family offices, especially ones that are now being led by millennial that are moving into the family office space and philanthropy mm -hmm. and in impact investing, they're all looking for ESG metrics. And if you don't have them, you're not going to get the money. You're going to lose the customers. Your competition is going to outmaneuver you. You're going to have this turnover issue that Mike has talked about. Um, anyway, I could get off my soapbox. I'd love to throw hey, something hey, about hey, innovation here too, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, because uh, Mark touched on innovation, and I think that's another huge aspect of uh, the advantage of DEI within the company, right? Um, and again, it's something that can be sometimes not as easy to measure, uh, but we at the same time know when we see people actually sometimes uh, take and steal and co-opt innovation from diverse types of uh, scenarios and stuff. Uh, so they know that it's measurable. They know that it's there. They know there's an impact on the bottom line. Um, but again, I come back to uh, the uniqueness in the cannabis space. In other traditional industries where maybe they're more entrenched and established, and it's harder for the smaller businesses and minority-owned businesses to break through, in cannabis, there's still a lot of, of play. There's a lot of a lot of real estate out there. And as these companies come up, they're not going to be, so to speak, funneled into having to be have their intellectual property and innovative properties co-opted by those bigger companies anymore. And I think these bigger companies need to start under, you know, I think they do already understand that, to be quite frank. I think that's why there's a lot of pushback on, on, key, on keeping people out of the industry, to be quite frank. Um, because they do understand that and they they try to you know literally take that information. The point I'm making here though is that you know um, if it's done authentically, and when I say it, you know diversity created within an, an organization and company at the higher levels and the C-suite and stuff like that, um, the acceleration that can happen because of the innovation is huge. Because now instead of trying to like figure out how to steal it from somebody else and how to take it and so on and so forth, you're actually working together to then go faster together, right? So anyway, just want to throw that out there. Yeah, that's great. Um, right. We got 11 minutes. Uh, another resource shared with me by my Harvard law friend. I learned from a uh, report, Seraphim in 2014, uh, fewer than 20 publicly listed companies issued reports that included ESG data in the early 1990s. But by the year 2014, the number had increased to nearly 6,000. So clearly this is trending. Um, but these practices do not just live at the C-suite level behind closed doors. The whole company needs to understand and be a part of the solution. So uh, how can companies educate their employees and other leadership levels on the importance of DEI and ESG and foster this culture of continuous improvement? Uh, Mark? Well, first off, to your point, 95% of the Fortune 500 last year had sustainability or ESG reports. So this is happening. This is happening all over Across industries, doesn't matter what industry you're in. How you get employees educated and um, enthusiastic and participatory in this process is it needs to start at the top. It needs to start at the C-suite. When you're starting an ESG project, you need to have a cross-functional committee 
that's made up of everyone from legal to investor relations to government affairs to operations to each of your business units, cultivation, manufacturing, retail, to your, um, to your accounting people. So that way everybody's on board because everyone touches ESG in some way, shape, or form, whether you're reporting it to the SEC as part of your 10K and your risk exposure, um, or you're reporting it to against third-party frameworks for investors. Um, and so everyone has to understand it. Prioritizing it, you need to use a management system to move your path along. And it could be something as simple as Excel spreadsheets, but I prefer Asana, or there's all kinds of ESG measurement and management system tech solutions out there that can keep everybody on track. But I would also suggest that a company adopt, if they don't have KPIs or OKRs, uh, or using something like the Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOS, that really chunks this project off into pieces. The first time you do an ESG assessment, it is massive. It is a tremendous amount of work and time. And the biggest challenge is that time and money to get it done. I've seen more companies start to go down this path and then stop, like Canopy, just because of money. Um uh, and, and so breaking this up into chunks, the, the old adage of how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Um, sorry for PETA people out there that may not eat elephants. Um, but but that's that's really how ESG is. You really need to just start somewhere. You start with that, that figure out what's what are the most material issues to your company? Where are your strengths? Where can you differentiate? How is it in alignment with your mission, vision and values? And start to measure and report and get everybody across the company working on it, knowing that measuring this is part of their job. Wow. Um, Mike, would you like to add to that one? Yeah. I mean, I think those, those are great points and I agree, you know, it, it definitely starts at the top because if you're in an organization or a company where at the top, it really isn't committed and dedicated. I mean, we've seen it time and again, I've gone through this myself where it's like, you know, you're just fighting an uphill battle. And what I want to encourage people actually to think about is if you're in that kind of environment, you know, think about, you know, creating another environment or joining a different environment within cannabis. I mean, that's kind of the beauty in cannabis right now is that, you know, we are starting a whole new industry and paradigm. Um, and so, yes, yeah, it starts at the top, but it also starts with us. It starts with everybody that isn't even at the top, right? Because, you know, when we are complicit and say, okay, we're going to keep going along and taking a paycheck uh, from a company that we know is not really committed to the causes that we care about, you know, that's a vote with our time and our time is our most valuable asset. Um, and, and, and I think that's really important to note. Um, now, it's not to say don't try to make those efforts, don't make those attempts, you know, but if you don't get that buy-in from being from the folks at the top, quite frankly, to Mark's point, it, it's it, you're an uphill battle and it's probably not going to work. So find somebody in cannabis and support their mission with your time and your expertise and your experience uh, that can make that difference. If you're a company um, and you claim to care about that stuff and you really don't at the end of the day, you know, um, honestly, then in my opinion, like spend as little as you need to on that because uh, we're coming for you, so to speak, right? I mean, people, the companies that are really looking to build something real, I think you're going to kind of plow those other companies over at the end of the day. So, you know, anyway, that's another soapbox moment, but that's, I think, important to say. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, if it's not starting at the top, to Mike's point, I just, there are a bunch of slides I just posted, a bunch of incentives about why the C-suite should be paying attention to these issues. Create a presentation about why you think your company needs a formalized ESG program or a CSR program to start, a programmatic program, and then start to measure it. The other thing is incentivize success. High executive pay to KPIs and other goals. Uh, I know a particular cannabis company publicly traded right now that wants to start to tie their executive pay to DE&I and ESG metrics. And they're going to set out metrics and then they're going to tie executive pay to it. Other industries do it all over the world. And that gets people, they, they stop saying it's not my job because then it is part of their job and they're incentivized. That's a perfect segue to this next question, actually. Um, and another resource shared with me by my Harvard Law student friend uh, from a Korean study in the International Journal of Financial Studies. It states, new investors may be reluctant to invest in companies that lack satisfactory ESG performances and existing investors could exercise the stewardship code at shareholders meetings when the company is not up to par with ESG practices. Uh, Mark, Mike, any final thoughts on this? You know, just that, as I mentioned, we are seeing the largest uh, exchange of wealth in the history of the planet. Um, going from baby boomers to millennials, uh, survey after survey from people that survey millennials, 
indicates that they care about these issues, as does Gen Z, as does Gen Alpha. If you're not working on climate, if you're not measuring your climate, if you're not considering what you're doing with your packaging, if you're not taking a look at your diversity and your impact in your community, uh, how you're paying your employees and treating your employees, the health and safety of your employees, you're right. Those new investors are not going to invest. Um, it's just not going to happen. And institutional investors that have thresholds and requirements, um, once cannabis becomes legal, uh, and institutional investors start to flood the market, uh, or large publicly traded companies, they're going to want to take a look at your company. If you don't have these programs, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to get the buyout that you're looking for. You're not going to get the added investment that you're looking for. You're not going to get the top talent that you're looking for. Yeah, and so I, I just noticed Tiffany's question here, and uh, it's kind of actually along the lines of my, my last thoughts here too about you know where to start, right? Because yeah, profitability is definitely a challenge right now in this industry. Uh, but again, I, I want to point to the fact that taking measures, taking steps in the areas of ESG and DEI is shown time and again. You know, Mark has all the stats, right? Like I, I, as you can tell, I'm not loaded with all the stats and information in that way. But Mark's got the stats, the reports. If you need that stuff, he's got it, right? Um, and th there's so much data now that shows that investing in these areas actually does give you a positive ROI. So if you're struggling with profit, if you're struggling with returns, it actually it might seem counterintuitive because sometimes it takes an initial investment that you're not used to. And we're, we haven't been trained to think that that's a cost of goods. That's a cost of services. Right? We've been trained to think that other things like marketing and stuff might be, which and marketing gets cut pretty quickly too often. Uh, but, you know, DEI, you know, it, we, we're, we're thinking it's not, but it's not just about DEI. You're actually investing in your employee turnover, you're investing in your brand, you're investing in, you know, your innovation, you're investing in all the things that actually do lead to more profitability. As far as where to start with the small steps, honestly, if you don't know where to start with the small steps, that's where just having a conversation with somebody else that's either done it, like a Nibble Distro, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, having conversations with companies that are maybe more diverse than yours in the first place, um, having conversations with organizations like MCBA, M4M, just having those conversations to get started, joining us on the equity workshop tour as we come across the country, tapping in those conversations, that's where it starts, right? And figuring out what's, and then you can identify what is the simple thing for you that you can implement now and then build from because, and start identifying and measuring where's the ROI. So hopefully that helps with that. Great. Just two minutes left. And I'd like to make sure we address any uh, Q&A questions in pre-reg. Uh, David, there was one that came in through pre-registration um, about the 2025 global conference. Um, yeah, so just briefly to add, and um, you know, as we look to upcoming events, January of 2025 is not all that far away. It's gonna be here before we know it. Um, so in an attempt to ensure that we are capturing you know, the full marketplace, uh, the global marketplace that this cannabis industry is, is Team International is going to, uh, we're moving our committee week to South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa, um, in January 2025, there's sponsorship opportunities to, again, if you want to put your money where your mouth is and show how you're supporting a global marketplace and emerging economies and, you know, the global self, that's a great opportunity. You can follow up with us. Uh, I can direct you there, astmcannabis.org. Um, yeah, that's, I think, addresses that question. Great. Um, it looks like coaching how to coach clients to be proactive and not cut corners to save money companies that do the bare minimum uh training employees to be proactive in avoiding employment practice liability interesting and regulatory requirements cgmps let's see how how can we make all this feel not feel unaffordable and overwhelming you know, yeah. I'll I'll start with that one, maybe, you know, because I think Mike and Mark have really done such a great job at <clears throat> highlighting a lot of the key points of like where to begin and, you know, measuring what matters. And I like to think about it as, and I know this isn't true universally, but don't think of regulations as a burden. You know, I think it's easy to do that, but think of it as an opportunity. So not a burden or a checkbox. And if you're not seeing it as an opportunity, you're probably not looking at it correctly. Challenge yourself. CGMPs, for example, have been around since the 60s. They are what, they're the minimum global standards that keep our food supply, our drug supply safe. ESG, as Mark mentioned, in the 90s, there were like, what, 20 companies, I think was a study you cited, Bethany. Now 95% of Fortune 500 companies are doing it. Now we have metrics to show that it actually improves profitability and performance. So if you're seeing this as a burden, you're overcomplicating it. 
you're not talking to the right person, you're not looking at it right. Call Mike, call Mark, you know, call us and we'll get you to Mike and Mark. There are resources available. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And it's a, it's a business imperative. Honestly, I, I think it should be pretty clear today that it's, it's a must do. It's not a nice to have if you want to be in, you know, surviving and looking out for the next, you know, five years, even, you know, the last question right uh, here is around consolidation and contraction in the marketplace. Well, how do you differentiate yourself? Oh, I've got some metrics to show you that my business is more successful than the neighbors. It says my weed's the best. What's going to matter to these investors, whether it's a family office or otherwise, it's going to be having these metrics. So if there's not enough reasons already, think about that. Absolutely. Uh, we've gone a little bit over time, but uh, we'll just start wrapping up. Um, I've got one more slide just for viewers here. Uh, I want to thank Mark and Mike for this amazing webinar. And thanks to everybody who attended live. As a reminder, all the past episodes are on the GMP Collective's website in case you missed one. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're interested in learning more about working with us, we offer strategic advising, subject matter expertise, data-driven solutions, and more to elevate your business operations. So head to the gmpcollective.com if you'd like to schedule a consultation. And thank you all for joining us. We will see you next month. And Sorry, real quick. Um, I, I sorry I didn't catch this earlier. The Equity Workshop Tour actually kicks off this Saturday, uh, March second, in San Francisco. Shout out to Valerie Taylor, uh, one of our sponsors with Liberty. Actually, I see on the call here today. But we're starting there. I, I don't know why that says September. It's actually from now through September, basically. So we'll be doing uh, a lot of stuff between now and September, all across the country. So plug in with us anywhere. Great. Thank you guys. This was awesome. Really appreciate having you on. And yeah, follow the equity workshop. We'll be there in Santa Fe, I think in mid-March, forget the date, but I'll be on the website, either MCBA's website or ours. So cheers. Thanks, Bethany. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you, everybody.